an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! James O'Brien, weekdays 10 till 1 on LBC. 21 minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC as we continue to, uh, uh, well, to attempt to make sense of David Cameron's apparent determination to lead us into yet more military action in the Middle East on this occasion. Uh, today, of course, the discussion is about extending the bombing campaigns to which we currently contribute in Iraq over the Syrian border. It seems moot in some ways. It seems fairly irrelevant, that, that sort of line in the sand on one side of which we currently drop bombs, on the other side of which we, we currently don't. But there is obviously more going on here and I wonder whether you're confident that what is now likely to happen will render you safer in Britain. Uh, one man who is not, one very prominent opponent of military action in Syria last time David Cameron asked Parliament to endorse it and he remains or at least he did before that speech similarly opposed to it this time is the author and Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens fits into that tiny category of commentators whose position is not easy to predict on any given of an issue. He joins me on the line now. I should probably mention, Peter, that you wrote a book called The Cameron Delusion. Uh, are we seeing another Cameron Delusion underway here? Well, in this case, it may be a delusion that Mr. Cameron has rather than a delusion that people have about him. Of He's course. just invented 70,000 supposedly moderate non-Islamist uh, Syrians who are going to spring to our side when we start bombing Syria. Uh, I think most people in the House of Commons, and anybody who knows anything about Syria, are baffled by these. They're even more fantastic than the 27 billion pounds George Osborne discovered miraculously in the... In the <laughs> just, just one topic at a time, Hitchens, please. <laughs> and this is a government of fantasists. They, 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 they're moderate, moderate uh, non-Islamist Syrians and billions of non-existent pounds all over the place. Is this weapons of mass destruction echoes, then? Well, I don't know. It's not, it's not even as, as worked out as that. That was a group of people systematically trying to persuade a, a, a country to go to war on the basis of nothing uh, and creating supposed evidence of a threat that wasn't there. This is a, this is a person who doesn't really have a clue about why he wants to go to this war that I can see, or, or one that he's prepared to admit. He basically was, had his pride wounded when Parliament refused to authorise bombing in 2013, and is now trying again on the principle that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. I, the connection between the outrage in Paris and, and the, the, the government's desire to bomb Syria is pretty tenuous, uh, but he is trying to do this, and also there's a constant his, his, his media allies are constantly saying, oh, this vote is a foregone conclusion, everyone's going to vote for yes. war this time, as if it were settled. I don't believe that's necessarily so. I would imagine anybody listening to what he said and listening to the debate so far uh, would be uh, thoroughly unpersuaded of the urgent case for any kind of British intervention in Syria, and rather worried by the Prime Minister's strange estimate of what's going on there. What, what purpose does he actually seek to fulfil? I'm not clear about this. He tends to treat this as a rerun of 2013, but in 2013 he wanted to bomb the the forces of the Assad government. Now he says he wants to attack Islamic State, uh, but does he? Uh, who, who's, uh, who's, whose forces will British bombers mm. be uh, be working on the side of in this case? Uh, it, it looks as if he still he still believes, for reasons I don't fully understand, that the Assad regime is uniquely intolerable. An odd position for a man to, to take who recently entertained the butcher of Tiananmen Square in Buckingham Palace and the butcher of Cairo in Downing Street, but there you are. He seems to have this strange sensitivity about the Assad regime as being uniquely horrible among all the horrible regimes of the planet, but he hasn't ever explained why, and one again, one wonders whether British policy is actually being made in London, or whether, as so often in matters of the Middle East, it's being made in Riyadh. I, the, the, the only way in which our policy makes sense is if we're trying to please the Saudis. Who well, no, there is one other way. They definitely want to overthrow the Assad government. There is one other way in which it makes sense, isn't there? And, and that, would, that would involve the Russian support for President Assad and the notion that if, if, I mean, whoever wins the war, Putin wins the peace and ends up exercising a lot more control over Syria than he did previously. And that, that regardless of Saudi influence, that puts them in the same sort of boat as Iran and other countries where Western interests are neither represented nor met. 
But that's jumping into the process halfway through. It yes. Was, it, was, it was Britain, not particularly strongly, but as part of it, Britain, France, United States, and the Gulf countries, which began the destabilization of Syria, which led to this dreadful civil war and turned hundreds of thousands of people into refugees and corpses. Before then, Syria, for all its many faults, uh, was a stable country with which we had been prepared to have very close dealings, indeed, particularly during the first Gulf War. Uh, and somehow or other, it suddenly transformed itself into the worst dictatorship in the world. I mean, it, it, it no, but that, that, I, I take that point, and I understand that but point this, impli this, implicitly, yeah, but it doesn't... And, and the, the, the Russian interest in this yeah. has, has, has only really grown because Russia opposed the, the attempt to bomb Syria in 2013. Uh, Russia's influence in Syria is not actually that great. Their love for Assad is not particularly great, and their, their, supposed, their supposed desperate desire to keep the, the Tartus naval base, which is basically a, a couple of cable drums and, and, and a capstan uh, and a bicycle, is, is uh, much overstated by a neoconservative <laughs> propagandist. So uh, the, the, the real problem is that we have created um, a much closer link by our actions so far between Assad and, and Russia. Also, Russia has played this uh, actually much more cunningly than we have. Uh, they knew what they were doing when they intervened. They knew whose side they were on. They, would, they have decided that if they really want to, to combat Islamic State, one of the major forces which actually stands against it is the Assad government and the Syrian National Army, which was becoming exhausted and was losing battles and, and failing to recruit, but nonetheless continues to hold territory which Islamic State would very much like to capture, and since the Russian intervention began, has actually been successfully pushing uh, it, it, its control over areas of the country which, is a, it, which it had lost. Now, it's very complicated in, in Syria. This is a, probably a five-sided war. Uh, which side of these five are we on? Yes. And how many of the five are we backing, and how many of the five are we opposing? Nothing that David Cameron has, has yet said uh, explains what exactly it is he, he aims to achieve. The other thing about these interventions, it's all very well saying. But he has it. No, hang on, Peter. I, I, I just he has said that it would render us safer here. He, we should well, take no, this I, action to help it, make us safer. He hasn't explained why, but that is no, his I goal. Think it still explains why this is just an assertion. He's also said the United Nations resolution, a Security Council passed last week, authorised this action. This is straightforward, straightforwardly not true. It, it doesn't contain any proposals authorising. The, the resolution doesn't authorise any action. It doesn't cite Chapter Seven of the. Of, of the uh, of the UN Charter, which is the basis for any military action, it was purely a propaganda motion and doesn't contain the authorization. And only on November the seventh, for goodness' sake, the, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Commons was advising against military intervention. What changed that made it so urgent? Well, Chris Bin Blunt has. Uh, I mean, he chairs the committee you refer to, and it'd be interesting yeah. to ask him that question because he's just stood up in the House of Commons and endorsed David Cameron's contention. He's, of course, the chair of the committee that described the Syrian policy as incoherent just six weeks ago. Can I can I ask you to do us a favour? Peter Hitchens. Well, I don't can, know. Can, what it is. Can I, well, I'll ask you. You don't have to do it. Can I turn you around now? And instead of explaining why we shouldn't do what David Cameron proposes, can you explain why we should do nothing? Well, I, I would like us to do something, oh. but the, the, our government is so completely set against the something, which I think would be the wise action, uh, that it, it's futile to argue for it. And if you read the excellent dispatches of the, that Prince of Foreign Correspondence, Patrick Coburn in, the, in, Patrick Coburn in The Independent, the man who understands this better, what's quite clear is that the forces which are actually resisting Islamic State on the ground most effectively are as follows. Uh, the Syrian Kurds, uh, the Syrian National Army, uh, the... The Shia militias and, and, and Hezbollah and, and Iran, and they are now backed, of course, by the Russian air power, which is considerable and, and rather greater than we thought it was until it was tested. Now, these forces, if we, if, if our actual objective is, and who can object, who, who can be against the objective of defeating Islamic State where it is, these are the forces with which we should ally ourselves. If we were serious, these, if we were seriously opposed to Islamic State, if Islamic State was the existential threat which we claim it is. Now, remember, this is a simple, this is a simple and direct parallel. When we were fighting Nazi Germany, uh, the we ended up having an alliance with Joseph Stalin, who was almost as appalling and bloodstained a tyrant as Hitler, because our main objective was the defeat of the Third Reich, and the only way to achieve this was to have that alliance. If we're really so concerned about Islamic State, why won't we ally directly? with uh, the Assad government and its, and its army, the Syrian Kurds and, and, and the Russians and the Iranians. Because I don't think we really mean it. Now, because that's ruled out and because Mr. Cameron's extraordinary 
prejudice against Assad, uniquely of all the tyrants in the world, the only one he won't do business with, <laughs> because of this strange, because of this strange prejudice, and, and one thinks also of Bahrain, a country in which we recently opened a naval base, notorious for torturing and uh, brutalizing its, uh, its political opposition. It, why is it that he, that he, that he, is, he seems to me to be much more determined to overthrow President Assad than he is uh, to actually combat Islamic State? If, if he were in, interested in combating Islamic State, then the program which I've suggested of allying with the most effective forces against the Islamic State would be the one that he would adopt, but he won't. The other thing about this thing, and it's quite simple, and one always has to remember... Are, are, we are late for the news, Peter. Final, final point. 1969, recall that any military intervention however limited it may be, uh, can turn in time into something much, much bigger. A few troops were sent into Londonderry in 1969, mm. take the Catholic population against the B-specials. That ended up a 30-year military engagement involving thousands of troops. No one ever intended it. It's incredibly easy to get into something. It's fantastically difficult to get out again. Therefore, before you go in, you should think about it. I see no signs at all that Mr. Cameron or his supporters are thinking about this. Peter Hitchens, author and Mail on Sunday columnist, and as I um, suggested to the very tiny number of people listening who may not have been familiar with Peter, well, one of the most original thinkers in the country. Some serious pause for thought there. He referred to the journalist Patrick Coburn, and, and very interestingly, Patrick Coburn wrote about this issue before David Cameron's speech, and the tagline that appeared on his piece in The Independent today, Britain's policy in Syria and Iraq depends on two partners on the ground, the Iraqi army and the moderate Syriot opposition to Assad and ISIS, but the former is weak, and the latter barely exists. And who did David Cameron mention in his speech as our key and crucial allies on the ground in the event of this bombing campaign escalating? Yeah, you got it. The Iraqi army and the moderate Syrian opposition to Assad. I'll finish just by saying this. War is an easy thing to talk about. There are not many people uh, of the generation that remember it. The right honourable gentleman served with distinction. The last war I never killed anyone, but I wore a uniform. But I was in London in the Blitz in 1940, living in the Millbank Tower where I was born. Some different ideas have come in since. <laughs> and uh, every night I went down to the shelter in Thames House. Every morning I saw Dockland burning. 500 people were killed in Westminster one night by a landmine. It was terrifying. Aren't Arabs terrified? Aren't Iraqis terrified? Don't Arab and Iraqi women weep when their children die? Doesn't bombing strengthen their determination? What fools we are to live in a generation for which war is a computer game for our children and just an interesting little Channel 4 news item. Every member of Parliament tonight who votes for the government motion will be consciously and deliberately accepting the responsibility for the deaths of innocent people if the war begins as I fear it will. Now that's for their decision to take. But this is a quite unique debate in my parliamentary experience where we ask to share responsibility for a decision we won't really be taking with consequences for people who have no part to play in the brutality of the regime which we are dealing with. And I finish with this. On October the 24th, 1945, and the former Prime Minister from Bexley and Old Sidcup will remember it, the uh, United Nations Charter was passed. And the words of that charter etched into my mind and move me even as I think of them. We, the people of the United Nations, determined to save future uh, generations, succeeding generations, from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has caused untold suffering to mankind. That was the pledge of that generation to this generation, and it would be the greatest betrayal of all if we voted to abandon the Charter and take unilateral action and pretend we were doing it in the name of the international community. And I shall vote against the motion for the reasons that I have given the House.